Please welcome Professor Kate Bowers. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction and thanks everybody to, uh, for coming and listening to me, even though it is this late in the afternoon and you're all desperate for cocktails, I'm sure. So I'm going to be a good girl and try and stick to my 50 minutes. Um, when uh, Don and Jackie emailed me to say that they'd like me to um, come to talk to you about situational crime prevention, I was rather pleased about this because it's something that's very, very close to our hearts at the JDI and situational crime prevention is at the very heart of what we do in terms of trying to reduce um, crime and prevent crime from happening <coughs> at University College London in, in our Department of Security and Crime Science. So, what I'm going to actually do is start off by just, and I'm, hope, I'm really hoping here that I'm not ten, um, teaching my grandma to suck eggs, as we say in England. You say that here too, I don't know. But I'm going to tell you what situational prevention is and, and define it um, um, just very briefly, just so that we all know um, what I'm talking about um, with the review that I, can t I, I go on to do. We're going to then talk, I'm going to go and discuss with you which situational approaches show promise. And something that's really important here is the fact that it's, it is, you, you can't make the assumption that something that works in one place or context is going to work in another place or context. Something about situational prevention is it's very context dependent and hopefully I'll be able to hammer that home with some of the points that I make later on. Um, one of the other things that I want to just talk about is things about standard of evidence. And I'm sure that many of you are being evaluated yourselves, have thought about some of these issues. Standards of evidence in the field of situational crime prevention um, is a really, really important subject because unfortunately, there are, there are a fair few bad evaluations out there, as well as quite a lot of good ones. So we need to think about what level of evidence we need in order to get a really seriously good evidence base in terms of what works. Um, once I've done that, what I'm hoping to go on to do is to talk to you a little bit about what, what um, we are starting to understand in, in terms of situational prevention. And this is some of those trickier issues um, in terms of evaluation. And they're, made, uh, and they're things that I'm sure people grapple with in all evaluation fields. Um, we have particular problems in situational prevention in terms of th doing things like working out how important um, the intensity, the actual amount of treatment you put, in, you, you put into your scheme is, or how long-lasting some of these effects are. We don't talk very much about cost-effectiveness. We often find it difficult to get data on those things. And then there's this completely tricky issue with situational prevention, and it's always raised of whether or not all that you're doing is pushing the problem elsewhere. This is the idea of crime displacement. Situation prevention works because it, it, um, um, under the belief that crime can be reduced by in, employing different types of techniques. Firstly, those that increase the effort associated with committing an offence. So these are things like target hardening or, um, co or, or, con or controlling access to places. We have things that increase the risk associated um, with committing an offence. So things like um, surveillance, CCTV. We have things that reduce the benefits of such actions. We might conceal um, some of, the, be some of the, um, the benefits that offenders might have uh, undertaking a particular type of crime. We can reduce provocations for that might otherwise precipitate crime. And by that we mean doing things like uh, neutralising peer pressure or reducing frustrations, perhaps separating rival fans at football matches being an example of that. Um, and finally, there's the whole way in, in which you can remove excuses that offenders might otherwise use to justify criminal action. Some examples here being d doing things like posting very clear rules about what is and isn't acceptable in a particular situation or circumstance. So just before I move on to review um, situational prevention, I just wanted to put up a, um, a something that Ron Clark uses as an example of the power of opportunity, of, of really thinking about manipulating opportunities in reducing problems. This shows the chart of gas suicides in England and Wales, um, from, starting from the 1960s through to, to the um, 1970s. And what you can see here is that the gas suicide um, rate plummeted in exactly the same way as we see a, a plummet in the percentage of, uh, of, of gas which was actually carbon monoxide. So as the, as, as the, as the, kind of, as the um, carbon monoxide content of, of gas um, plummeted, so did gas suicides. This means check that small change in terms of the gas supply um, prevented something as deep-seated to people as, um, as suicide. 
Now, if changing opportunity can do that for suicide, surely changing the manipulation of the environment should be a good way of uh, reducing problems such as uh, petty theft or uh, residential burglary. So, do situational measures work? Um, I, a bit, I want to sort of make a bit of a disclaimer before I tell you whether they work or they don't work. And that's these challenges that we have to rely, a reliable evidence base. So what, what in particular is hard about doing um, evaluations in situational crime prevention? Well, firstly, it, 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 situational prevention itself is inherently context specific. So it's very hard to apply things like um, randomised assignment because, it, because things need to be put very specifically in a particular... And, and you have to look at the, at the actual um, area itself before you can work out what to do. So, so trying to find some sort of randomised control for that is a very, very difficult thing to do. Also, here we are talking about areas... We're not talking about individuals. It's much easier to assign individuals to a treatment or a control group. It's very, very difficult to do it. Believe me, I've tried many ways of doing this um, when you're talking about areas instead. Another problem is that many um, schemes rely on packages of interventions. So, um, because we're out there talking to the community and they say there's this problem, there's that problem, things are thrown at a community at the same time. So we might have burglar alarms going in, we might have high visibility patrolling, we might have CCTV cameras. And if there is an effect of that screen, that's great. But what's difficult from an evaluation point of view is it's very hard to identify which of those things cause the drop in the crime problem. Many evaluations in situational fields are conducted retrospectively, and the problem for evaluators is that means we can't get brilliant information in terms of what was done where at what time. But I believe that we need to do more of this kind of work, and I'm going to give you an illustration of how I think collecting this kind of evidence can be really important from an evaluation point of view. Um, then we get onto the sticky issue of displacement and, um, and the fact that things like displacement, cost effectiveness are actually very, very problematic to measure and few evaluations get to the point where they can undertake um, um, th these kind of analysis with decent methods. Okay, so with that disclaimer out of the way, I can tell you that the most recent um, 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 systematic review of situational measures, which was undertaken by Rob Gourette, um, reviewed 206 different evaluations and found that generally they're pretty effective. So 75% um, of them were found to be effective, 12% um, not effective, and the rest were mixed findings or inconclusive. Um, Rob and uh, John Eck then did a little bit more work into this and they wanted to see whether or not um, you know, this, this effect is moderated by um, the type of place in which you put these situational measures. And we, uh, they noticed here that, um, first of all, um, we can see that the percentages of the, of the author's conclusions that were effective. We can see that actually, interestingly, residential and public, way, um, and public areas seem to, while they were still very effective, seem to be slightly less effective with situational measures than places like retail or transport hubs. Um, so that some of the reasons why this might be the case is public places a little bit um, are open because they're public, of course, so this means that perhaps trying to manage measures in those kind of settings is more difficult, or you might find that the people who, the place management is more confused, it's more confusing who, who ought to be um, owning these kinds of interventions. Um, another way they split the data was by type of intervention, and in fact, um, um, 79% uh, of um, the interventions that they had evaluations for fell into one of these seven categories that you can see here. Um, what we find is that, um, again, we, there's an overall quite, quite positive picture, but CCTV um, and lighting initiatives don't seem to be quite as effective as things like SEPTED, which is crime prevention through environmental design, um, or, for instance, access control. Um, one of the reasons for this might be because these are more popularly done, CCTV and lighting, and they're the kind of measures that tend to be thrown at places, kind of in, a, in, a, in an off-the-shelf sort of way. So it might be that these things are put in just as, oh yeah, everybody knows these kind of things work, without a huge amount of thought in terms of context. So... Um, that seems to be quite um, useful. We, it, it's great. It's great news for us that situational measures work. But 
Is this actually valid evidence? The review done by Rob um, relied on what the author said in terms of whether things worked or not. I mean, in, in all these cases, they had some sort of level of evidence in terms of data. But it did, uh, does open up the whole question about um, what decent evaluation evidence actually is. And one of the things that, uh, um, that, that um, Sherman et al., for instance, have said that we need to do is consider evaluation design. And what they suggest is that we, knew, we use what's called a level three or more on, on the Maryland scale of scientific um, validity. And basically, what, the, what, the, 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 um, what this is saying is that you need a control area. Loads of evaluations of situational crime prevention measures don't have a control area. So, if you think about the consequences of that, we're not taking into account the counterfactual. We're not taking into account what would have happened in the absence of these schemes anyway. So, we need to perhaps restrict to those that at least got some sort of comparable area in which to see um, how, how uh, crime um, changed anyway in the absence of some sort of intervention. Um, one of the ways we wondered about trying to increase this level of evidence uh, um, in terms of looking at whether situational measures worked was by use, uh, looking at meta-analytical reviews. And um, these are always uh, have got very strict standards. Uh, you probably, well, many of you might have heard of the Campbell Collaboration Reviews, which, which uh, suggests that we need to have a particular standard of evidence. We need to know what our inclusion or exclusion criteria are. So we need to say we're only going to include those that are Maryland scale three or above, for instance. And they also are systematic searches of databases to try and make sure that we don't, we're not biased in terms of the evaluations that we find. The other thing about meta-analytic reviews is that they assess um, effect sizes independently of the author's conclusion. So they don't just take the, uh, the author's word for it, they've done the statistics right, they use the data and, and come up with, a, with an effect, with an effect side in, independently. Okay, so some of the reviews that we have of that level of, of that standard of evidence in situational measures are firstly um, the um, Railshire Farrington review on street lighting. Now, the N was little, it was quite small in this particular review. We're talking about 13 evaluations which were up to this standard of evidence. Um, but of, of those 13, uh, generally they found that there was improved street lighting did reduce crime by 21% um, in the areas receiving the intervention compared to the controls which had no improvement so that looks quite encouraging something that was really interesting about this review is that while street light lighting um, was um, uh, something that was uh, interesting was that actually the improved street lighting um, does not just affect crime that happens under the cover of darkness in fact street lighting uh, street lighting demonstrated significant effects during the daytime and so you, you wonder why, what's light, lighting supposed to do? It's supposed to make things less dark, right? So surely there must be some sort of natural surveillance sort of uh, mechanism going on. But this questions that. This says there might be something else going on which causes cause street lighting to be an effective way of reducing crime. Um, Welsh Farrington and others like Kate Painter have speculated that perhaps this is a result of increased community involvement. So the fact that street lighting went in um, changed the, the community dynamics somehow and the community um, um, started to self-police in a different way and this is why they think that perhaps um, uh, uh, crime reduced during the, the daytime as well as at night time. But it highlights the importance of considering how measures work as well as the fact that they just work, whether or not they work or not. Um, another review is that from C of CCTV evaluation. This is based on 44 evaluations. Overall, this review found that there was a modest but significant um, desirable effect on crime. Again, there's a but and there's a contextual issue we need to think about. Uh, it, this is because it depends very much on the context and the type of crime that is addressed. So, it's effective at reducing vehicle crime, CCTV. But the systematic review says it's not so good at preventing violence or assault. It's particularly effective at reducing vehicle crime within the context of car parks. So instead of just going, we've got a crime problem, let's throw CCTV at it, we need to start thinking we've got a crime problem, is it in the car park? 
um, are, we, we, are we trying to address vehicle crime with this particular initiative? So this demonstrates that thinking about the context really does matter. Throwing CCTV in one situation is going to have a very different result to throwing it into another. Okay, so trying to be clever and see if we can use these meta-analyses in some, in some um, interesting way. What we decided to do was actually try to get the systematic reviews we could find on situational prevention, two of which I've just talked about, and bring them all together to see if we could uh, get some, some um, interesting new evidence about what works. So these are the five reviews that we brought together. We had the street lighting one, the CCTV one. We also included a review that had been done on repeat victimisation strategies, very much a situation approach, public area surveillance approaches and neighbourhood watch schemes. So for each of those we were able to get hold of um, the, um, the, uh, the, um, the effect size that, um, that the authors of, of, the, um, of the different uh, programmes under that particular to topic um, had, uh, had calculated. So we could calculate, we could actually bring together those effect sizes in one place. This just shows, and I'm sorry if it's not very clear to you at the back, it shows um, the number of the cumulative number of the, stu of the studies um, that were included by year of publication. So overall, we've got um, 110 different um, pieces of evaluation evidence. And we can see that situational crime prevention um, evaluations uh, began uh, to start, started really in the 1970s and then they really started gathering momentum during the 80s, 90s and the noughties as we call them. You can see that there's a bit of a tapering off at the end and that's because the systematic reviews had already been done in 2007 which is why you get that kind of flattening effect there. But you can actually see that there has been quite a lot of um, work going on in terms of, of um, evaluations of these kind of situational measures. Um, this is probably not very good to look at if you're all feeling tired and I'm certainly not expecting you to, to, to pull out any one thing from this particular graph but what I would like to say about it is that um, basically this is odds ratios, is the individual effect sizes of all those 110 across those five different systematic reviews that I'm talking about. They're from um, something like 63 different individual studies. And what we can see here is this is the null effect line. Anything on this side favours treatment. That means it, was a, it, it looked like it was, it was promising evidence in terms of reduction. Anything this side favours the control. In order for something to be significant, you can see the dot in the middle, that's the effect size, and the confidence intervals around it, everything has to be this side of one in order for it to be a significant reduction of crime. But what you can see is that almost three quarters of the effect sizes are kind of on the right side of one. So this is bringing, this is sort of um, uh, helping to confirm the evidence of the, of the GRUT study that actually situational measures, even when you use those with a high level of evidence, do seem to be um, kinds of approaches which work in terms of crime reduction. What we were able to do, given that we had all these lovely effect sizes and we wanted to get our hands dirty with them, is we systematically coded these on a number of factors. So we coded them in terms of the year of publication of the evaluation, the country in which the intervention was implemented, the outcome measure, which crime type they were trying to combat, and the physical context of the intervention. It would be lovely to be able to do um, this for all sorts of other kinds of variables. One in particular would be funding strategies and agency context. It would be could work out a whether or not well-funded initiatives did better than less well-funded one. That would be quite an interesting thing to say. We, can't, we just can't say that uh, uh, with the current state of affairs. So if you have these, these moderator variables, and uh, you, uh, again, I'm going to have to tell you what it says on this so you can hear me at the back, but you can see them. Uh, what we can, we've got here is we've got the... Um, We've got different moderator variables. So, for instance, this is the, this is the intervention type. And anything, again, this side of this, this line shows a positive effect. So all of our different types of intervention are showing a positive uh, weighted mean effect size. This is showing um, context in terms of... Uh, the, uh, the actual place in which something has been gone in. And like we said, we can see car parks are particularly successful places um, for situational measures. Um, as our residential neighbourhoods at the bottom here. Uh, I'm rather embarrassed to tell you about this one. This shows your country, 
And I'm afraid to say, folks, that um, situational measure, um, um, evaluations that have been particularly successful have been in the UK and the US, and Australia, hmm, I'm afraid that there's no significant effect there. <laughs> so, so we can see that actually by country you see some variation in terms of effectiveness as well. Um, in terms of crime type, as you might suspect, those which are property-based crimes fare better in terms of situational approaches than things like sexual assault uh, um, or um, other kinds of violent crimes. Um, by decade, it looks like the 1980s was a particularly, uh, and the 1990s were particularly golden decades in terms of situational measures having a particular impact. So, we know that uh, situational approaches are by and large quite promising, and we've done this from looking both in terms of what the authors say, but also in, in, in terms of using inf information from systematic reviews. Um, but what else should we consider? So, what, what should we be looking at over and above just whether or not things reduce crime problems or not? Um, I'm, so, I'm going to just spend the, the rest of the time that I've got, and I can see it's 29 minutes, um, talking about some of these issues. So, first of all, how much treatment is optimal in terms of at what point do we stop throwing money at the problem? Which approaches are cost effective? Which approaches are sustainable? And I, don't, and I think sustainability is, an, is a big issue across the board in terms of interventions. How long do our effects actually last? At what, at what point should we return to places and, and, um, start, uh, and start thinking about putting in further resources to, to, uh, to, uh, to, um, to check that we aren't going back to old crime problems that we had before? And then I'm going to talk about the, um, the classic of displacement and diffusion of benefit. Okay, and uh, here's another apology for you guys. I'm going to be giving you an example from England, which is using alligating. Now, I'm sure this is not something that you do in the Australian context, because housing is very, very different over here to there. But I just want to use this because it illustrates the point in terms of what the kind of methods that I'm talking about. So, here's our little alligator. These are our little our row houses, if you like, our terraced houses. Um, and this was, uh, this, these were, uh, there was a big initiative in Liverpool in the UK to put in these, these um, gates at the back of alleys in order to reduce burglary problems um, and in fact there was a huge amount of um, activity they put in over in, in, in the period of time they were doing this in, in Liverpool they put in over 3,000 gates and they actually managed to protect 45% of the, of the whole of Liverpool's terraced housing stock through these kinds of measures. And believe me, it was a big underta undertaking because there's lots of red tape associated with gating off the back of, a, of an alley because it's a public right of way, for instance. But this is, this is something that, what, that, that is used quite often in the UK to try and cope with burglary problems. So... Do, do, one thing that's very encouraging is that this is a very useful kind of measure and we did a, an evaluation of this and there was a 33% reduction in the share of burglary in the action areas relative to a suitable control, which increased to 37% when, when you started thinking about the gates that have been in for a year or more. It's got us thinking about sustainability, actually. So you can work out how many burglaries have been prevented as a result of that kind of activity. This is something we hardly ever record in, in situational crime prevention um, evaluations. And please correct me if, you, if I'm wrong. And if you know of any more, please let me know about them. I, I, there's, there's a certain number, but there hasn't been anything done recently that I know of. Um, it's collecting, firstly, what we call input intensity, which is the inputs to the schemes, such as um, equipment and staffing. And often this can be, this can be um, expressed in financial terms. So we're talking about things like the, the total cost of the scheme divided by the total number of households. How much money did you throw up per head? Um, of course, that's different from what we call output intensity, which is actually what happens. And quite often you can have quite a large input um, intensity and not a very good output intensity at all. And this is when we have implementation issues and problems. So you're throwing money at things, but nothing is actually coming out. So sometimes, really, it's, it's important to focus on, on, on outputs. What actually happens? How many locks were fitted? How many offenders completed their rehabilitation program? Um, how many... Alley gates went in, those kind of things. The great thing about output intensity is good for examining the relationship between what was done in terms of how much you put in and the impact you observe in, kind, in terms of crime reduction. 
So, just before I show you the slide showing the results, we wrote a paper on um, thinking about what influence intensity has on outcome. So, imagine this is spend per head, in, in maybe in Australian dollars here. What you might have is this situation that as you increase your spend per head, um, you're, you're, get, you're still getting a nice linear return for your money. So, it's worth continuing to, to, to spend extra money per head. It's a nice straight relationship there. You might, however, find that you get to the point where you're spending, say, $4 per head, but after that, you start to get diminishing returns. In other words, you're not getting quite as much outcome for every extra dollar that you put in. Uh, there's also, of course, the situation where you might have a flat lining, where it's absolutely no point at all in spending more than $3 per head, because after that, you, just, you don't get any more return for your money. And when we wrote this paper, we had a lot of people raising eyebrows about whether or not this was actually a possibility <laughs> that as you increase the amount of intensity, you get to a point where you start getting, um, you actually start getting a negative outcome. Um, we, we wondered if this was a possibility, and the only one we could think of was perhaps if, you, if you're pelting people so much with something like crime prevention advice, they stop listening to you altogether. So, you know, you've just overdone it in a particular area. But this whole thing about the relationship between intensity and outcome is a question that we just don't really know the answer to very often. Okay, so this is, we were able to do this for the alligating scheme that I've been talking about before. And here on this slide, what you can see is what we call the burglary ratio. And this shows what's, what's going on in the historic period. And the burglary ratio, very simply, is the share of the burglary going on in the treatment area divided by what's going on in the control area. Yeah? So what you're expecting, if you get a successful scheme, is just for this burglary ratio to diminish over time, which is exactly what you see going on here um, in the blue line. Um, what we've got here, this pink line here, is what we call implementation intensity. So this is charting the number of gates that went in, or the number of housing blocks that have been um, protected over time as a result of the scheme. What's nice to see is that we've got this kind of mirror relationship going on. As the intensity in, uh, um, in terms of the amount of, gate, of, of the housing stock that have been gated increases, we see, a re we, we see this reduction in the burglary ratio. And if you do the regression analysis, you can actually see that a lot of the variance in the burglary ratio can be explained by the number of blocks that you've protected or, or, the, or the gating that you've put in. That is good because it gives us more evidence that it's the gates that are causing that reduction in the crime problem. So this is why intensity is a very, very useful thing to look at in this kind of setting. It gives you further um, evidence that what you're doing is the thing that's causing the drop in crime. You can kind of take this a bit of a step further, and we realise that with, of course, with alligating, what does it do? It cuts off the back alley. So we might be looking at a differential effect for burglars that get in via the back of a property to those that get in from the front of the property. What should happen is it, it should reduce the number of people getting in via the back of the property. So burglary via the back of the property should go down. So we were able to, um, to separate out those different types of crime. And what you can see is, in fact, that exactly is what happens. You get a decline in the, um, the number of burglaries that, where the point of entry was via the back over time. Uh, if you then um, do the regression analysis with that cumulative intensity measure I saw before, what's really interesting is that the intensity measure explains 62% of the variance in the access via the rear of the property only. And it doesn't show any significant um, relationship with access via the front or other. And this is a hooray for us because it means that exactly what we're expecting to happen, which is burglary via the rear, is very, very strongly uh, going down, is very, very strongly associated um, with an increase in the measure that we're doing. It's, again, a further level of evidence that it's what we're doing that is causing a reduction in the crime problem. Okay, so moving on. So that's one kind of thing you can do. The other thing that we were able to do with this particular initiative was do cost-benefit analysis. I've heard a few people talking about that today. Um, it, it's a very, very difficult thing to do in any field. Again, in situational crime prevention, it's really very, very rarely done. But we were able to estimate uh, that by, by having lots of people collecting lots of information, we were able to work out the cost of a gate going in. And in terms of things like consultation, manufacturing, installation, uh, it was just about, it's getting on to £700 per gate. Um, uh, the Home Office at the time had 
had done a very extensive piece of work trying to work out how much um, the, the cost of one burglary was to society. They've done this for all sorts of different crimes. There's all sorts of reasons why it's difficult to do these approximations. And I, I can talk to you about that over cocktails in a while if you're interested. But they came up with the fact that the average cost of burglary um, that, 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 would be, that would be saved, if we can save one burglary, would be about uh, £2,000. Okay, so we've got all the elements that we need in order to do a cost-benefit analysis, and what we're able to do is work out the, co the overall cost of the gates, the overall value of the burglary saved, and then we can produce a cost-benefit ratio to see whether or not we're being cost-effective or not. This is what the uh, if you just if you use the the um, the, the whole the whole data set, we can see that we're just under being cost effective. So for every dollar spent, uh, we're getting a, a 96 uh, pence return. What's really interesting, though, is if you just divide out those alligators that have been in for 12 months or more, they, they were actually cost effective. So by the time that they've been in for 12 months or more, you were getting a return of, of, um, of $1.86 for every pound you'd spent. Now, this is the kind of thing that we often miss out on because we stop uh, evaluating after um, six months or three months or whatever it is. These measures only became cost-effective when they've been in for a year or more. This is why it's important to look at these sustainability issues in terms of um, how much bang you're getting for your buck in, in terms of input. Okay, so, so, um, this, so this made us think that sustainability was really a big issue that we need to think about. And it also made us think about how it was important that people check that these gates were um, under good repair, so they were able to continue doing their job for really quite some time. Uh, Cost-benefit analysis, as I said, is quite a rare thing um, in, the, uh, well, in, in this particular field. Um, here are some examples of some cost-benefit analysis that have been done. Uh, there's one by uh, Peter and Farrington looking at street lighting, which looked quite promising, a saving of, of uh, $6.19 uh, for every dollar spent. Um, we see uh, a repeat victimisation strategy, £5.04 for every pound spent. Uh, we can see CCTV cameras sometimes look like they're cost-effective as well. These aren't massive figures, but it's really quite useful to have some sort of idea of whether things are being cost-effective um, or not. What we kind of like, would like to see is to, have, to, to eventually get to the point where you've, you've got a kind of nice drop-down menu. Replication is really important here. It would be very nice to say, OK, we know these things work for burglary. All these things work for burglary. But actually... If you're going to choose between these things, choose this one, because consistently you have, you, it's better value for money in terms of its cost-effectiveness. But we're just not at the point where we're able to say that because the evidence base isn't really there yet. So we need to continue to do this kind of work in order to really be able to say, in choosing between locks and CCTV, go for locks because not only do they reduce the crime problem by 20%, but they're actually incredibly cost-effective and cheap as well. Um, okay, so moving on to this idea of sustaining or prolong prolonging treatment effect. Um, there's a concept called residual deterrence, which um, is something that occurs when a treatment has been conducted in an area stops, but actually the crime reductive effect continues. You might have heard about this in the context of police crackdown operations in particular. So what they do with the police crackdown operations is they look at whether or not um, when the treatment is stopped, when the police have stopped going into that area, whether or not they still continue to see a reduction. They often do. The pe period of time can really vary between, you know, three weeks to six months or whatever. Um, but these residual deterrence effects have been shown to happen um, for those kinds of um, operations. Um, you might be less familiar with the idea, you might be, but you might be less familiar with the idea of anticipatory benefit, which is kind of the, 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 uh, the mirror of residual deterrence. So Smith, Clark and Pease talk about this, and this is evident, re, evidence of a reduction in crime before physical implementation of measures. So you, you think, how on earth could that happen? So before anything happens, you're getting a reduction in the crime problem. And in fact, this study showed, um, of, the, of the information they could get hold of at the time, that it happened in 40% of, of cases where this was testable. 
Um, we were able to have a look at this ourselves. We managed to get some data on 21 burglary reduction schemes across the north of England. And we were able to have a look at this crime ratio thing again. And this time what we could do is we could look at, um, this was the before situation. And here we have our nice drop. You can see the green line for the after situation, the burglary ratio, showing that these schemes were overall effective. But what's kind of interesting is this little bleep here you can see. This is for the quarter before the official start, gates of the start dates of these schemes. So you can actually see there's been a reduction before anything was supposed to have happened. This is what's termed as an anticipatory benefit. You might ask why on earth this could happen, and here are a few explanations for why. Um, there's the possibility that you have um, preparation anticipation. So this is the, uh, the offenders believe that the program is operational before it is. They've been told that something's going to happen. Uh, they believe that something's going on, so they avoid the area um, before implementation has happened. There's the idea of publicity or disinformation, um, where there's rumours going on that something's about to happen. There's going to be a crackdown, for instance, and so uh, offenders change their behaviour as a result of that. Um, there's the idea of disruption. Um, lots of these places are, you know, crawling with people doing surveys before the official start date of something. And perhaps this activity itself improves natural surveillance in the area. It can, it can stop crime from happening. Um, other um, possibilities are what we call creeping implementation. This is the responses start, a little bit of response. They start before the official start date of the scheme. This might well happen in particular places. And there's also the ideas that it could be preparation training. In other words, you train the staff ready to start undertaking a piece of activity uh, they're not going to then go, oh, I'm not going to start using that until Saturday. They're going to start using it immediately. So this kind of preparation for things can cause these kind of anticipatory benefits. Also, it can just improve people's motivation in areas when things are about to start to happen. When we looked at our 21 cases, and we looked a little bit at the evidence that we could get, we found the most likely explanation for the anticipatory benefit that we saw um, was actually publicity associated with the scheme before it happened. And we're not talking about general kind of um, victim publicity that goes, you know, lock your doors. We're talking about publicity that says something is about to happen in this area. You put it into the, you put it into the local paper. We're about to clamp down on this particular crime issue in this area. And we're going to do it this way. Now, nobody reading that will know exactly, well, you might have advertised when, but nobody's going to really take, you know, go around with that, in the, that date in their head. They're going to know something's going to be going on in the particular area. What we suggest then, as a cheap way of eking out your crime, your crime prevention effect, is to actually start with a little bit of pre-scheme publicity. It's a really nice cheap way of starting things off. Say you're about to do something in an area to produce this anticipatory benefit. You then continue to publicise to say how wonderful you know, this, this whole thing is and you've got lots of activity going on in the area. And then to get your residual deterrence, you might say how successful it, it, it was, you know, everything was and how great the partnership working was and how it's changed the landscape in terms of you know, criminal activity in the area. So you might then affect um, offenders' um, perceptions for some time. We're not saying that this is uh, you know, going to be a, a, an answer to your crime problems, but what we're saying is talking about costs, pu adding publicity as a level on, on top of everything else, it's not a very expensive thing to do, and it can, can perhaps give you a more prolonged effect in terms of, um, in terms of the, the, the actual measures that you're putting in. So I'm going to um, finish off with... Um, having a little bit of a discussion about what we call the Achilles heel of situational prevention. And that's this whole issue about crime displacement. So, one of the most common criticisms of situational um, interventions is that crime will simply relocate to other times and to other places. And people believe that this might be the case because you're not um, addressing the underlying causes of crime. You're just, uh, you're just, you know, stopping that particular crime from happening. So therefore, you know, you might spend all this money in, in this particular area doing something great. And yes, your area is looking really good in terms of its crime rate, but the, uh, but the estate next door has got all sorts of crime problems as a result because people are just shifted there. So the idea of displacement is the relocation of crime from one place 
time, target, offence, tactical offender to another. There's lots of different types of displacement of possibilities. So, for instance, people who are doing um, burglaries and have been stopped from doing that might switch to doing car crime. That, that would be, be offence type displacement. Or people that were doing um, burglaries by um, entering via the rear of properties might start entering via the front of properties. That would be tactical displacement. But actually measuring all these things is quite a tricky thing to do in the first place place. Um, what's far more commonly analysed is spatial displacement, which is the movement of crime from an intervention treatment area to a nearby area. It's by way the form that's most commonly analysed. One of the things about displacement is if it happens, if it happens totally, it could completely negate or cancel out any scheme effect. So it's important that we're able to have a look at whether or not these, these things happen. However, there's a bit of good news, which is there is a flip side to this this debate about displacement, and that's the, um, the idea of diffusion of crime control benefits. Um, diffusion occurs when reductions of crime are achieved in areas that are close by to the initiatives, even though the initiative wasn't actually put into those areas. I was telling you about anticipated benefit kind of eking out your effect. This is a similar thing, but spatially. There is no line on the floor that says, you're in, you're out. This is the treatment area, this is not the treatment area. So therefore, it's very likely that offenders might um, uh, um, avoid a wider area than just physically where the implementation went in. And that's the idea of, of diffusion of benefit. So what does the evidence say? Do you find this displacement of crime to other areas? Do you find this dis dis diffusion of benefit? There's been, a lot, there's been quite a few reviews looking into this issue because it's so important for situational prevention. Um, a paper that I did with Rob Garrett um, looked at, um, uh, got systematic reviews in terms of, but it, we, uh, in this particular piece of work, we were concentrating on what the authors said in terms of um, evidence of displacement and diffusion. Um, we had 174 different observations, in, uh, sorry, 574 different observations in terms of whether or not um, displacement was found or not. Um, some of the things that we found that were quite interesting is firstly, as we suspected, spatial displacement is far more likely to be examined than any other sort of displacement. So 47% um, of our uh, sample looked at spatial, uh, were, um, were an analysis which looked at spatial displacement. Um, one thing that uh, is, is kind of interesting looking at these figures is that displacement is observed with about, oh, if you look at the total, totals overall across all types of displacement, is observed about a quarter of the time according to um, the author's findings, and so is diffusion of benefit, which is kind of quite good news because it makes me think that equals out a little way. <laughs> Maybe sometimes we're having a bit of displacement going on, but this is by no means going to always happen. There's lots of situations in which it doesn't happen, and there's lots of situations in which you actually find the reverse effect going on. The other thing about displacement that people get confused over is total displacement is incredibly rare in terms of the way that it is measured quantitatively. So even with, these, with, with this, which looks a little bit um, less promising, this could just be you know, a fraction of the crimes that happened in the intervention areas being displaced to other places. So from this um, review that we did um, using author's findings, it seemed to be the case that there was um, evidence uh, that we, we kind of have both displacement or diffusion, but it's not the kind of gloom and doom of it always causing displacement. Um, so, we wanted to do a similar thing. Again, what we had is we had um, our own, we had these findings from the authors, but we wanted to actually compare that to, um, fi to findings where we've done something a little bit more systematic, and we've made sure we had a higher level of evidence. And so, what we did in this particular piece of work was we actually um, found um, four, 13 different studies in which we could get an effect size for both the treatment area and for a suitable, what we call catchment area, which is the locations to which crime would be displaced if it was displaced. Um, and so what we were able to do in each case is firstly, oh, sorry, is firstly to produce an effect size um, for whether or not the scheme was successful or not, which is this one at the top in each case that you can see. And if it's again to the, to the right of this dotted line, it means it's successful. But we can actually produce a matching mirror 
if you like, um, effect size for the catchment area, for the buffer area for that particular scheme. Okay, so just in the same way, if you've got it to the um, right-hand side of the line, this little grey gray dot here and the confidence intervals, it means that we see um, it favours it favours treatment, we're seeing diffusion of benefit if it's this side of the line, and we're seeing displacement if it's that side of the line. Okay, so if you have a look at this, we've got, um, as is often the case when you're doing a systematic review, we've got the best and the worst case scenario up here, and um, comparing these, in both cases, if you look at the weighted um, mean effect size, we can see that the treatment has, it looks like it's, it, um, it's, it's been successful, um, and if you have a look at the um, the, uh, the effect size for the diffusion of benefit or displacement, it's kind of sitting on that one. Um, for the worst case scenario, it's a little bit to the right of the one um, for the best case scenario, which means, again, it's kind of in line with what we found before um, when we looked at the author's finding, that, that um, displacement does not necessarily happen. Um, and if, if anything, there's a very slight but not significant um, uh, effect in, uh, that looks, look, looks, look, looks like there's going to be diffusion of benefit of these schemes. So, um, this, so, so this systematic evidence says at the moment our best guess is that situational measures, measures don't necessarily displace crime. Um, one thing to just say about this kind of work is that um, diffusion um, the, um, studies that look at displacement analysis are far more common than those that look for diffusion of benefit. So there's actually also bias in terms of what, what's looked for. So just to summarise, um, some of the important things that I want to say are firstly on aggregate the majority of situational efforts are reportedly effective, perhaps about three quarters of them. Um, diffusion of benefits is just as likely as displacement according to the current, um, the current evidence that we've got. Um, situational crime prevention effects are compounded by anticipatory benefits sometimes. On the aggregate, cost assessments leisure, uh, measures are less common. Uh, little is known about the sustainable impact of, of situational measures. Um, a piece of work by Bragger and Bond that was quite interesting showed that situational measure, measures appear to have more enduring reduction um, effects compared to fo focused policing initiatives. So, but we don't always measure sustainability properly, so we don't really know the answer to that question. So, just finally, what do we want? What should be? What should we be doing next in terms of evaluation, or next, or next in terms of thinking about situational measures? That we need to have a lot more on sustain, sustainability and cost effectiveness so that we can start really understanding how long term these effects are and, and starting to answer questions about which we should choose over others, not, from the, not just from the point of view of effectiveness, but also cost effectiveness. We need to look more about the extent of forms of displacement other than spatial. Um, it's, less, it's far less common to see things that look at things like a crime switch, temporal switch analysis, those kind of things. They're harder to measure. Actually, displacement itself is very, very tricky to measure anyway. Um, there's also this terrible possibility of interaction between different forms of displacement. So you've got both spatial and temporal displacement. And actually trying to keep an eye on where they might go to is, is really difficult. How would you start looking for those kind of um, interactions or effects? Um, exploring the relationship between dosage and crime reduction. Um, I hope that you, you saw that I gave an illustration of that. Again, that's not systematically done in the field. Um, we need some further reviews to examine the degree to which, for instance, control, controlling access to facilities um, or reducing anonymity or uh, reducing provocations can reduce crime. We've got little bits of evidence on that, nothing systematic. We need to prioritise individual evaluations where we haven't got evidence. There's still quite a few situational measures that haven't been particularly well evaluated or there haven't been replications of these. For instance, there has been some stu studies that say that um, replacing beer glasses with safe alternatives is effective but this has only been done once or twice by a limited group of people we need to find out whether or not that is a more universally found effect um, and finally there's the whole thing about um, new crime types um, situational measures tend to sit nicely with property crime and high volume crimes there is more of a portion, there's more evidence that, in fact, it could be a very useful thing um, from the point of view of some of the other more expressive crimes as well, but this is, we're kind of on the edge of looking at those things more. <laughs>
And just finally, something to say, people always think, oh, when they think about situational crime prevention, here's some, some attempts to try and make it a bit prettier. So we can see here on the left-hand side that that's a bit nicer than just having spikes. And we can see here on the right-hand side that they've actually changed bollards into artwork. So it can be done. It can be done beautifully. It can also be done quite in quite an ugly manner, but it's a possibility of doing it like this. Thank you very much for listening, everybody. Yeah, no, I'm, I mean, that's a very, very good point. And actually, the whole thing about what you put into the cost of a burglary being prevented is just such a can of worms. And, and the, um, the Home Office report that I talked about before does include quite a large amount of things that they thought about in terms of things like, um, you know, cost to the victim taking time off work or, um, you know, criminal, some of the criminal justice service kind of costs, those kind of things. And, you know, there's also this question about whether or not you're putting things in anticipation of crime like insurance costs, for instance. And so, yes, absolutely. In some ways, the more um, comprehensive those costs are, you, but you, you have to start thinking about reliability of them in terms of whether or not that really is a, a reasonable um, costing. Um, and, of course, on the other side, you need to make sure that if you do do this kind of exercise, your costs that you've got in terms of the treatment also reflect the, kind, the, the similar sorts of things. So, I mean, absolutely, you, you, you're right. They, the, the, you know, these, these things can be blown out of proportion. Um, it would be... It would be great if we had some sort of universal way of thinking about costs, but that's just, you know, we're still developing that. Um, I also agree that, um, you know, you do, feel, you do hear quite a lot of positive things about situational measures. That's absolutely true. And, it's, and, and like with any other type of intervention, you do see backfire effects. And I think one of the things that I haven't really had time to say here is one thing that you really do see is poor implementation. And that's a really big issue. Um, and often there's really quite limited advice on how to put these things in well. Um, so, yes, uh, yeah, I, I would like to say that I'd moderate what I've been saying with some of those, with some, uh, that kind of reply to your question, yeah. <laughs> Because these measures are so very visible, potentially, I guess, people may feel safer. There may be benefits in that sense. So uh, the question is, uh, you know, whether that's been looked at and charted, and then more particularly whether after some time there is a, then a, a reversion back to the mean so that people are no longer feeling safer. Um, yes. Because that is a sort of a, a, a cost that, that really is an important one. Yes. I mean, actually, that. I haven't seen a huge amount of systematic studies that look at fear of crime, you know, related to situational measures, but you're absolutely right. They, they would, you would think, because they are so visible, have some sort of impact on people's fear levels. They can also be very much ignored by the public. And in fact, there was one, um, just, just off the top of my head, I can remember uh, an evaluation that we were doing um, in, in Nosy, I think it was, the street lighting um, initiatives. And uh, we were asking people what they thought of the new lighting. And about 90% of them said, what new lighting? <laughs> so, I mean, the thing is, sometimes these things are seen, sometimes they're not seen. Um, there, there are some, uh, I mean, for instance, the whole 
principles of design against crime. Um, we have lots of work going on in the UK as well as here. I know there's, there's lots of work going on here in design against crime. It's sometimes to make these things a little bit less noticeable so that they are they kind of blend in with the environment. But in doing that, you, so, so, so presumably some people might feel more fearful if they can see something in front of them. So I think that, that there's good cause to be doing, to, to do some more research on whether or not that in, in fact is the case. And absolutely, over time, I think people become sceptical of, of these kind of measures. And for instance, the alligating uh, example, you might have people not bothering to lock the gates after them. Those kind of things over time, they get a bit old. So both those points... Absolutely valid ones, yeah.